Happy Saturday, East Tennessee. Welcome to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. I tell you what, I love the spring. I know we, we had this real cold snap here these last two days, but it's one of my favorite times of the year when everything starts blooming again. I know, uh, you know, it was kind of interesting. We had spring break a couple of weeks ago, and one of our friends, we were down in uh, the panhandle of Florida, and one of, one of my friends back in Knoxville was talking about how beautiful everything was starting to bud and, and bloom here in East Tennessee, the grasses becoming nice and lush and green. Uh, and it's so beautiful, but spring for many people brings itchy, watery eyes, runny noses, and continual sneezing. Sometimes you can even see the pollen haze in the air. So allergies are a major public health concern every year with more than 50 million Americans suffering from seasonal allergies. And Knoxville, as beautiful as it is, as you probably are aware, is consistently ranked in the top five or ten cities every year, just about, that are most challenging for allergy sufferers. So we're going to cover that in the first half of our show today. We're going to talk about seasonal allergies. Uh, now, I do want to mention spring's also a time to clean out the closets, wash the windows, and get organized. So later in the show, we're going to have Jessica Albright from Organized and Simple Living join us to talk about how to get your home organized in top, and in top shape. Now, our first guest today is a good friend of the show, a friend of mine, Dr. Ty Prince. He is with the Allergy, Asthma, and Sinus Center. He's always been so gracious to spend time with us over the years. He is a Knoxville native. He's been practicing for over 25 years, and he's a specialist in adult, adolescent, and pediatric allergy, asthma, and clinical immunology. Good morning, Dr. Prince. Welcome to More Living. Good morning, Jim. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. How are things going with you and your family this spring? Fantastic. We're just uh, watching these pollen counts go high, and I'm getting busier at work is the only problem. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you are. It is definitely spring. Things are blooming. Bradford pears, dogwoods. Uh, it's just a matter of time before we're going to see that haze on our cars from the pollen, the yellow pollen. As of right now, Dr. Prince, what are the primary irritants that are affecting people? Right now, we got tree and mold and a little bit of grass. The tree's real high right now. The mold is down just a little bit, which is unusual with all the rain that we've had, but it, it'll pick back up again uh, once it starts to, when the ground gets real wet and as it starts to dry, we'll see those mold counts come up. But they're, uh, today's going to be really high, or I'm sorry, today's going to be moderately high. Uh, tomorrow and next week, it's going to be very high. The tree pollen is. The mold will come up, we think, a little bit too. But uh, we're going to get really high levels of, mold, of tree pollen uh, Sunday and throughout next week. You know, I always kind of wonder, it seems, Dr. Prince, that when the, 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 the temperatures change dramatically, it certainly affects my sinuses. When we mm -hmm. have, so in March, the latter half of March, everything started blooming and, and started becoming green and we started to see some things bloom. Then we get this cold snap. We had a hard, I, I'm not, I mean, did we have a hard freeze the last two nights? I'm not sure. I know we had frost this morning. What is, how yes, does that affect did. something like allergies? Well, sometimes the frost will, will knock the buds down a little bit. Uh, it's got to get pretty cold, though. Uh, but those, those patients that do suffer from allergies have a lot of nasal and sinus inflammation that will be affected by these weather changes. And then, of course, if you do have a sinus infection or any other type of chronic sinus inflammation, it really affects you a lot more. Does it, when it, when we get a cold snap like that, does it make it worse in a couple of weeks? Does it just make it bounce back even worse? Uh, you get a you get a bounce back from the pollen after a rain, uh, and uh, the, but the, um, the it just the the weather change, the temperature changes, the drastic temperature changes and barometric pressure changes really cause a lot of problem for allergy sufferers. I'll vouch for that. Now, for many of us, Dr. Prince, the first instinct when our allergies are triggered is to reach for over-the-counter antihistamines. So what are yes. some of the best treatment options for seasonal allerg allergies, and is it better to get ahead of irritants and preemptively take over-the-counter meds? It's better to get on the topical nasal steroids. Those are the most effective, but they take a day or two before they start working. 
And you should see major differences by four or five days after regularly using the topical nasal steroids. That's uh, Nasacort, Flonase, Flutigazone, Rhinocort. Uh, most of those are over the counter, but by the way, you can usually get them cheaper if your doctor writes a prescription for the generic form, uh, depending on your insurance plan, of course. But the uh, as far as taking the antihistamines preemptively, uh, you know, the, the long acting antihistamines, you got Claritin, Allegra, and Zyrtec. Those, uh, if you take them a, an hour or so before you get out into the pollen, uh, it's going to help you. But if you take them every single day, like some patients will start taking them a week ahead of time, uh, that's not going to help as much because they're, uh, you're going to start getting tolerant to them in about 20 or 30 days. So you really don't need to take them several days before, but the topical nasal steroids, which are much more effective than the oral antihistamines uh, or second and third generation antihistamines, Claritin, Allegra, and Zyrtec, uh, those, uh, the topical steroids, if you start those a day or two before the pollen hits, then, uh, then that's going to help you the most. All right, so that, but those two take a little bit. You said four or five days. They really build up in the system, kind of over well, a period of a few the, days. You're going to you're going to see significant improvements in two days, and if you don't see differences in five days, then the nasal steroids probably aren't going to help. They're going to max out, and so if you've used them for five or more days and you're not seeing big differences, then don't waste your money. Now, Dr. Prince, do you, um, ha have you seen good ways to manage seasonal allergies that are not medication? Well, all I get is the, uh, I get reports from patients, you know, uh, the, uh, the old uh, mainstay for, for whom remedies is the uh, taking the local honey. Uh, but, you know, that, that local honey doesn't have, it's got some clover pollen in it, some flower pollen in it. But it doesn't have tree and grass and ragweed pollen in it. So, But it might have some kind of other effect. We don't know. It's never been studied, to my knowledge, and done a scientific study where you do placebo-controlled uh, trials and that kind of thing. But the, uh, uh, certainly the home remedy folks uh, and the people that sell the, the honey uh, really uh, speak highly about it. But, uh, you know, I, I, I've used it myself and had not seen any differences, but uh, that's just one patient, so I don't know. Uh, what I do know is no one complains for the, about the taste. Well, that's that's for sure. Now, I know that uh, I know a lot of us those to suffer with the. That's kind of interesting because we suffer with the tree and the grass pollens. I mean, isn't that a pretty common thing for a lot of people in East Tennessee with their allergies? It's oh, more yes. from from Absolutely. the trees and the grasses. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is Kentucky so gonna, Kentucky, and, Kentucky and, fescue seems to be a such a popular grass here. Does that does that have more uh, issue with allergies than when you get further south and get into your centipedes and some of the other options for hotter weather? That's a, that's a great question. The grass pollen is notoriously cross-reactive, so it doesn't really matter what type of grass typically is elevated. It's going to the majority of people who are allergic to grass are allergic to all the grasses because the pollens are so immunologically similar. They look identical, too. They look like little olives, little tiny olives with a hole in it. Uh, but they, all the pollen under the microscope looks the same, and then the DNA is different if, you, if you're if you able to, uh, to to do a DNA check on it. But uh, most of the grasses are, are pretty much equally uh, allergenic, and it just it makes a difference of how high the level gets and whether or not you're the one mowing the, the, the grass. Uh, but otherwise, the specific type won't make a difference. We're visiting this morning with Dr. Ty Prince. He is with the Allergy, Asthma, and Sinus Center here in East Tennessee. Always been so generous with his time. When we come back, I want to get a little bit more into some of the asthma issues. And I do want to pivot a little bit, Dr. Prince, into COVID symptoms. That's something people are going to want to really be aware of this year. And then finally, uh, treatment options. So stay tuned as we visit with Dr. Ty Prince here on More Living with Jim Brogan as you're tuned in to News Talk 98.7 WOKI. tuning in this is more living with jim brogan 
here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. We're on every Saturday, both at 9 o'clock in the morning, 9 to 10, and again at 3 to 4. So if you've missed part of today's show, if you missed part of our first segment with Dr. Ty Prince, you can catch it this afternoon at 3 o'clock. We also have our podcasts online. You can hear every show, as well as my dollars and cents segments and other great content at my website. Go to broganfinancial.com and uh, click on radio. Dr. Prince, uh, he's with the Allergy, Asthma, and Sinus Center here in Knoxville. And the Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology states that approximately half of all asthma in adults is caused by allergies. So, Dr. Prince, how do seasonal allergies affect asthma? Well, it depends on if you're an allergic asthmatic, of course, or a non-allergic asthmatic. Uh, by the way, it's up to 70 to 90 percent of pediatric asthma is wow. from allergies. It's a much more common cause. In fact, it's almost if you have a, if you see a pediatric patient who you think has asthma and they don't have allergies, it's probably that they don't have asthma. But anyway, the uh, um, the pollen, of course, is going to uh, affected uh, in the lungs, you're going to get more of a wheeze. We think it can be either a communication between the nose and the lungs called the universal airway. The upper airway communicates with the lower. Or in the case of some allergies, especially cat dander, uh, it can get down into the lungs. We think the particles can actually stimulate the lungs directly. Uh, and we do sometimes see more severe reactions with some of the animal danders that are really smaller. Uh, than the uh, especially cat. What are some uh, uh, are, what are some other triggers that can actually cause an asthma attack? Well, the most common we see is uh, our second most common is going to be a viral infection. Uh, that's what you're going to see. Those are going to be responsible for the majority of the ER visits, but up to 50 to 70 percent of those people that show up to the emergency room with an asthma attack will have a sinus infection. So we tell the, the training doctors either address the, every uh, emergency asthmatic patient, uh, either address the fact that they do or do not have sinusitis or go ahead and treat them for sinusitis in some cases if you're not sure, but they have risk factors for sinusitis. And then another common trigger is acid reflux, and we'll see those patients. Typically, they'll have some heartburn during the day, but not always. But those patients awaken at night because the acid reflux is worse at night, so they'll wake up uh, short of breath sometimes, and that's a red flag. All three of those, four of those triggers, if you don't, if you don't get rid of those triggers, then the, the asthma is just going to keep going. You know, that's interesting. Um that in adult and children, the difference that so many children, it's really probably more of an allergy issue. So I guess the most important thing with anybody that has an asthmatic symptoms is to just quickly get a diagnosis and, and get treatment. Yeah, so let me point out again, you've got to get breathing tests. You've got to quantify the asthma. You can't just treat the wheeze. You can wheeze from the tip of your nose down to the smallest airways in your lungs but the key with asthma is also diagnosing the quantity of air and the speed it's coming out. Uh, you've got to do that, and you've got to do that every time you change the treatment. You don't know if the treatment's working or not. The patient might come in to say they feel better, uh, but you might do a breathing test, and their breathing scores might be dangerously low in some cases. We call those poor uh, perceivers, and they're the most dangerous asthmatics. Those are the ones that walk into your office. You ask them how they're doing. They say, I'm doing great. You do a breathing test on them, and it looks awful, and they're about ready to uh, go to the emergency room and don't even realize it. Wow. Uh, tell you what, I, I do want to get into COVID. Uh, you know, it's been so disruptive in our lives and the medical landscape. T can you touch briefly, Dr. Prince, on at this time of year, b balancing allergy symptoms with COVID yes. symptoms and what people yes, should be that, looking for there? And I would look at also uh, what I would do is compare it to COVID and the flu uh, because they're, those are systemic illnesses. Those are head-to-toe illnesses. Uh, that don't typically respond to antihistamines and cortisone nasal sprays. Uh, so certainly you're, you're less likely to have a fever with allergies. Uh, you're not going to be responsive. You might, you know, the, the one, one thing to think about is have you ever had allergies before? If all of a sudden 
in the middle of the spring, you're you're having nasal congestion, runny nose, and, and a low grade temperature, but you've never had allergies before. Uh, most of our patients develop allergies over years, so they get to where the springs are just a little bit worse every year. Uh, but with the COVID or the influenza, you're going to get within hours. You're going to feel bad from head to toe. It's not going to respond to your to your antihistamines and cortisone nasal sprays. Of course, with COVID, is notorious for the lack of sense of smell and taste. Uh, and so certainly if you have that, that might lean more toward COVID. Um, remember, too, the first question we ask people when they're having bad allergy attacks and they're unsure of uh, if it's COVID or, or influenza, have you been exposed to anybody else that's sick? Uh, you're not going to have two or three family members coming down sick at the same time. I'm sorry, coming down with allergies at the same time. Uh, but you will have them coming down with COVID, sure. COVID or influenza at the same time. Uh, so that's another clue. The first question we ask is, have you been around anybody that's sick? Uh, family members at, at, at UT, it's uh, dorm rooms and that kind of stuff. You'll see a whole floor of a dorm break out with flu sometimes. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Dr. Prince, uh, when it hit my family, you know, the, all three of us here at the house, we have one daughter in college, and she had been home for Christmas, and she had already had COVID at college in the fall. Mm -hmm. But then my wife and I and my daughter all got COVID at the same time. Uh, wow. And so, uh, yeah, and and the flu actually. So, uh, wow. and, and we got through it okay. But uh, at any rate, uh, it, I'll just echo what you said. <laughs> you know, obviously we all got stuff at the same time, so we obviously weren't. You know, had something. We obviously had something going on. Hey, Doctor Prince, what are your th this? You're listening to More Living here on News Talk 98.7, and this is Ty, Doctor Ty Prince. He is with the allergy, asthma, and, and um, sinus center here in, here in East Tennessee. What are your thoughts on the development and distribution of the COVID vaccine? Well, I think they're doing as good a job as they possibly can. Uh, you know, what's surprising are some of the people that don't show up for their appointments to get the shots, and then you've got you to give the shots to somebody. So uh, my family the, didn't qualify for the uh, – for the, for the shot, but uh, I got them on a waiting list. Uh, then you just had to be at one of the pharmacies, and uh, you just had to be available and get down there within 30 minutes to get the leftovers. Uh, so they were, and of course, what they did, what the pharmacies do and the other offices, hospitals that have them, uh, you get two doses dispensed per person. So if you get somebody else's first shot, then you get their second shot as well too. But right. let me let me point out again that this the first thing that came out was that people were having allergic reactions to these vaccines. They the majority were not allergic reactions. They were side effects. And so we're seeing we're seeing five cases of anaphylaxis per million of shots. That's a little bit higher. Now that's the Pfizer. The Moderna is only 2.8 episodes of anaphylaxis per million, but uh, in the flu shot is about 1.5, one and a half cases per million of anaphylaxis, but none of those anaphylactic patients, at least the first month, uh, none of those patients were hospitalized. I haven't checked the data in the last month, but in the beginning, none of those anaphylactic cases were hospitalized. We've got 570 million people who have died from this pandemic, and I haven't had a single patient that's able to come up to anything close to a side effect that compares to it. So I'm sorry, these folks that don't want to get their vaccine, you, you better be thinking about that. Uh, it's, it's just, I, I, I don't understand it. Uh, we do recommend that patients who have a known allergy to polyethylene glycol or um, uh, polysorbate which is in a lot of stuff. Uh, if you have a known allergy to that, that uh, that you uh, uh, that is contraindicated, or if you've had a history of anaphylaxis to another vaccine, then you need to see an allergist, and we could test you some to some of the inactive components of those vaccines, so that we don't make the mistake of telling you that you can't get the the covid vaccine uh but you better you better be thinking about a really good reason why you shouldn't get that vaccine 
Uh, well, that's a, that's a very uh, strong word. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, you know, of course, all adults in Tennessee now are eligible for the vaccine. Uh, now there's testing, yes. uh, continued testing in adolescents and children as well to see, you know, how that's going to evolve. Hey, I do want to ask you real quick before our time is over, Dr. Prince. Um, you, you know, there comes a time where I know for me, I'm there. And, and of course, I've been visiting with you about my own needs. Um, and you've been so helpful, uh, and as well as my wife. At what point, you know, I guess for me, you know, there just gets a point where you're tired of dealing with it and you realize, okay, we need to do something about this and do a treatment protocol. How difficult are the treatment protocols? So you've got allergy shots, you've got allergy drops, you've got all these different options. Mm -hmm. At what point does somebody say, you know what, I need to pursue treatment? It's a personal decision, you know, but if it's having a major effect on your quality of life where you can't go outdoors when the pollen's high and you can't put your tank down on your uh, convertible and you can't go out on the water with your boat, uh, you know, it's, it's probably time to get more aggressive therapy. Uh, we've done the studies, the time studies that look at how much time you're spending dealing with purchasing the medicines and the cost of those medicines to make you feel better. Uh, but if you know if it's affecting your quality of life uh, and you want to to do more aggressive treatment, uh, then the, there's less time involved in those aggressive treatments than there are purchase you know driving to the drugstore, getting the medicines and and taking the medicines, etc. Um, but certainly, if you have asthma and your asthma is being affected by your allergies or you're getting frequent sinus infections and respiratory infections, then it becomes more of a medical problem at that point. Sure. Because uh, th these moderate to severe allergies, while you're having an attack, you are more susceptible to viruses, not just c c catching the virus, but having a more severe course of it. Now, that has not been shown with the COVID, but it has been shown with the cold, uh, cold uh, virus infections, the rhinoviruses, and with influenza uh, and with uh, mono. Uh, some of those patients will have a much more severe course if they have moderate to severe allergies and especially if they're suffering from them at that time. Well, Dr. Ty Prince with the Allergy, Asthma, and Sinus Center, how can folks learn more about you and the Allergy Center? AllergyASC.com, Allergy Asthma Sinus Center, AllergyASC.com, and and uh, and uh, that's probably the fastest way to do it. And then we have all the all the different information. There we have 46 locations in four states, and so wow, you can you've got maps and, and you can make an appointment online and fill your paperwork out online as well. So great guy, Ty Prince. They do a great job over there, really the leaders in this area. Thank you so much. You're always gracious with your time. It's great to talk with you. Have a blessed Easter weekend, Dr. Prince, and thank you for coming on. You too, Jim. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. That's Dr. Ty Prince. AllergyASC.com. Check them out. Uh, tell you what, when we come back, we're going to talk about spring cleaning. And we have a guest uh, who has her own business that helps people with screen cleaning. Uh, so we're excited about that. Her name is Jessica Albright. Uh, we're also going to have our dollars and cents segment. What are the options for your 401k when you leave your job? So, so don't, don't go away. This is More Living here on News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to More Living. I'm Jim Brogan. You're listening to News Talk 98.7 WOKI. In just a moment, we're going to talk about spring cleaning. We're going to welcome Jessica Albright. She is owner of Organized and Simple Living, and we're, it's a great time of year to do spring cleaning, organizing, and all those things. Uh, before we get to Jessica, however, it is time for dollars and cents. When you retire or leave your job... You may have a decision point on what to do with your 401k or other retirement account, 403b, 457, whatever the case may be, any kind of a company retirement plan. So there's a few options. One is you could cash it in, take the money out. If you do that, the funds would be taxed as ordinary income uh, typically. And if you're under 59 and a half, well, it actually depends on when you separate service, but potentially there could be a tax penalty as well. You could also roll your money. If you get a new job, you could roll your company, your 401k, into a new 401k 
with your new company. So that would be a direct rollover to a new 401k. You can usually do that. Uh, you always have to check with your current company plan, make sure they allow that, but typically you can. And then you would have it consolidated with the new 401k. Uh, and there's no tax on a direct rollover like that. Now, you can also continue on with the old 401k usually. Most company plans now do, you do not make you take that money out of the 401k when you leave employment. You could leave it there. The other option is to do a direct rollover into an IRA. Now, as a rule, the right kind of an IRA which I'm a big fan of no-load brokerage IRAs, meaning no commission or load, sales load when you buy things. Uh, you, you just get so much, usually you have so much more access to investment options and alternatives than you get in a company plan like a 401k. You know, most 401ks only have maybe 8, 12, 15 choices, maybe 20. And in the right kind of IRA, you can pick from tens of thousands of choices. So, you know, I think an IRA platform is, for the most part, can be a better platform for a 401k or for your retirement account, I guess is a better way to say that. But it's got to be reviewed and analyzed. And it's not only the investment options, it's also what are the fees? What are the fees in the 401k plan? What are the fees? Are, are there administrative fees? And what are the fees of the mutual funds? And if you have that in an IRA, what are those fees? If you have multiple 401ks, how much are you getting hit with fees? So there are a lot of things that can come into this. Also, the age at which you separate service from your employer could also be important. Because it could, you know, sometimes when people leave their current employer, they have access to their 401k with no tax penalty. But if they roll it into an IRA, an IRA, they lose that access. So there's just a lot. So your age could depend. If you're pre-59 and a half, it could be a big issue. If you're after 70 and a half, it could be a big issue. So the bottom line here is what to do with an old 401k is a big decision and really could have a dramatic impact on your long-term success or failure in retirement. Now, uh, I have a guide that I have just published on pensions, buyouts, and retirement income. I've been talking about 401ks, but pensions and pension buyouts, this is all kind of connected. Fewer and fewer people now have pensions, but there's plenty of you listening that still have pensions. You may have a pension where you're being offered a lump sum buyout. Be careful that you don't just automatically do the money grab. But if you'd like to get my guide, it's called Pensions, Buyouts, and Retirement Income. You can go to BroganFinancial.com, click on Resources, and if you'll scroll down, it's about the fourth or fifth guide on the page. Again, it's called Pensions, Buyouts, and Retirement Income. You can download it. It's, you can download that guide. It's complimentary. Again, go to my website, broganfinancial.com, and click on resources. Do check us out at broganfinancial.com. Uh, we've just tried to put out as much information for you to consume so you can make informed and prudent decisions that can impact the quality of your life in retirement and beyond. Uh, I've got my next class at the University of Tennessee, two-part adult education. It's on May the 4th and the 11th, financialsurvivalforretirement.com. That's the name of the class. But go to financialsurvivalforretirement.com. You can click, uh, you can download the syllabus and you can click to register. There's a short video from me in two two-hour sessions on May 4th and the 11th. I want to cover seven key areas that I think you need to address to be successful in your retirement planning, whether you're getting near retirement or already retired. That's what that class is specifically geared to. We do work with some younger folks, but that class is really focused and geared on getting ready to retire or if you're already retired. So again, that's financialsurvivalforretirement.com. Now we're officially into spring and spring cleaning makes it on the to-do list this time of year. And also organization closets, pantries, arranging the garage, or washing the windows. Uh, and I know our spring cleaning list, well, my wife loves her lists, but they can be long and daunting. And our guest in this, these last two segments is going to help us figure out where to start and what to accomplish. So please welcome me in welcoming Jessa Albright. Jessica Albright, she's the owner of Organized and Simple Living. Good morning, Jessica. 
Good morning. How are you? We're doing great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, every no spring, we make a list of items that need to be cleaned and, and organized. The list goes on and on, and sometimes it's really kind of overwhelming. In your view, where do we start? When we, What should be on the top of our spring cleaning list? Um, well, I think you're totally spot on when you say that people love their list. Um, and oftentimes... I find that people spend more time making a list um, than actually, actually doing do it. Like That's so true. Started. Yeah. Um, so a lot of my clients, when they come to me um, about organizing their home or their their business office or whatever space they're they're wanting, they just don't understand where to start. Um, I think that because again, they're they have this vision of their mind of all of the things that they need to accomplish, and then they get kind of paralyzed. I find that with honestly, probably 99% of my clients. Um, and I tell every single one of them, you just have to start. Throw away your list. I love a good list also, but you just have to really focus in on one area, one space. For some people, it's even one cabinet. You know, it really depends on the kind of severity of your disorganization <laughs> um, and my clients range from super organized to completely disorganized. So um, my advice is just to start, if that makes sense. <laughs> well, and also the thing that's coming to my mind, Jessica, is balancing cleaning versus organizing. Yeah, I mean, to me, sure. of course, you know, a couple of times a year we think about things like cleaning our windows, doing our baseboards, dusting ceiling fans. Mm -hmm. So... Or, or, you know, how do we balance that this time of year with getting organized? Well, I think that, you know, be, cleaning and organizing is definitely two separate things, but they totally go hand in hand. I don't ever organize a person's space or room or home without also cleaning it at the same time. I think that's very counterproductive. Um, but honestly, this part of the year, I think a great place to start for everyone, no matter what stage of life they're in, is their closet. Um Especially if you live, you know, we're local, we live in Tennessee, we obviously experience a very wide range of weather, even on a particular day. Um, so we're getting to the time of year where we can really um, start putting away our cold weather clothes. And the closets are a great way to start. Um, the biggest advice, go ahead, sorry. No, no, keep, please continue. Um, the biggest advice I give to people when they're tackling something like their closet is, look at your closet, go through each item, and if you did not wear it during this last cold weather season, get rid of it. You're not going to wear it, I promise you. <laughs> so that is honestly a really great place to start. That was actually what I was going to ask you when you heard me take a breath, <laughs> because it seems yeah. like we hold on to things, a lot. so many of us do, we hold on to things mm -hmm. that we don't want to give up. And some yeah. of it, too, like, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, Jessica, my weight kind of fluctuates 10 pounds, mm -hmm. maybe. Uh, uh, of course, over, uh, since COVID, it's fluctuated up just a little yeah. more than <laughs> it's it's more like 15. But, you yeah. know, and you you hang on to things sometimes. But the reality is those things, once you know, uh, it's just hard. to. And it's not just our clothing. It's the things in our kitchen. No. It's the things in our pantry. So basically, if we didn't use it in the last season, we should just maybe donate it. Yeah, and that's and and you know sometimes people think when I come into their homes that that's my goal. I just want to throw away all their things, and that's definitely not the case. I mean, I am a sentimental person just like anybody else is, but I think you just have to give yourself a limit. So if you're sentiment, I have had clients that are very sentimental about clothes specifically. Um, and if you're sentimental about these T-shirts that you've had since high school. Honestly, that's okay. I think that you just need to find, you need to create some boundaries. So I always tell people, pick a size, pick pick um, a size of a, a bin, you know, like the storage bins that they sell, pick a size. That is what you are allowed to fill up with your sentimental items. That's a great That order. way, yeah, that way you're not, you know, you don't have an entire room filled with these things that you can't even enjoy because you're overwhelmed by how many things that you have, if that means sense. Yeah, well, I will tell you, I'm not getting rid of my 1998 Tennessee football national championship <laughs> shirt. 
And listen, I get it. I get yeah, it. But no, I... honestly, <laughs> another thing, and I wouldn't either if I were you, but another thing I try to tell people is if you're storing your sentimental things in a closet or in a box in your garage or in 20 boxes in your garage, what joy is that bringing you? I don't, you know, I try to explain to people, like, I get why you want to hold on to things, but it's not doing anything for you when you can't even see it. So nowadays there's point. so many there's so many creative things that you can do with your things to enjoy them. T-shirts, for, for one, I have four small children. They are going to have 18 times four years of memories that they're going to collect. My mother-in-law is collecting all of their T-shirts, you know, their special shirts, maybe their first Christmas shirt or their first baseball game shirt. And she's going to create a quilt for them when they go off to oh, college or, great. you know, leave our home. So that's going to be one item that you can fold up and store neatly in your home instead of having a whole dresser filled of things that you don't wear and that you're not even able to enjoy, if that makes sense. That's a great idea. You know, it's, well, I could go on and on and on about that kind of stuff, but I think that's a great yeah. idea and a great thought. Hey, I want to talk to you, Jessica, about kitchens and, and organization, pantry, spices, all that kind of stuff, and our dishes. Okay. Uh, but I tell you what, we need to get to our last break. So when we come back, we'll visit more with Jessica Albright right here in Knoxville about spring cleaning and organizing. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI. Welcome back to More Living with Jim Brogan, where it's all about living the best years of your life your way. This is News Talk 98.7 WOKI. We are on every Saturday from 9 to 10 a.m. and again from 3 to 4 p.m. If you don't catch us or didn't catch the entire show, you can always catch it on our website. Go to broganfinancial.com and click on radio. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Jessica, this is Jessica Albright. She's the owner of Organized and Simple Living, and we're talking spring cleaning and organization. I got to talk to you about the pantry and the kitchen supplies. It seems like it's just hard to get your arms around that, and our pantry seems to will organize it, and then it just gets out of control. Or yeah. what? What are some tips for the pantry? Do you believe in like buying a lot of organizers that you put a lot of stuff in the things, and then they're in the pan? I mean, where do we start with our pantry? So it's it's interesting you bring up the like uh, the organizing things to organize. Um, I think this is actually pretty funny because I go mo again most of my clients I go to their homes and they have all of the things. They have baskets, they have bins, they have uh, you know wire baskets and woven baskets and plastic baskets. And I think again it goes back to the same thing. You're 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 overcomplicating a very simple process. Um, with the pantry specifically, I really think it depends on what stage of life you're in. Honestly, um, the, the two bins that I have in my pantry right now are for kids snacks. The kids know they go into the pantry, they go right to those two bins. That is the only thing that they're really allowed to touch. <laughs> um, they're also seven and under, you know, so they're at a, a, a younger age. Um, but I just really think you have to use, um, you have to think efficiently. That's what I always think. You know, what do you cook the most with? Okay, if you make, I had a client recently, he made pasta, spaghetti every single night. So the, the shelf, when he walks into his pantry, the shelf that he sees, the shelf that he reaches the most easily, I put all of his pasta making things on that shelf. I mean, you just kind of have to think that way. And that may seem a little silly to some people, but you have to think, what am I going to be reaching into? What am I going to be making the most mess of? And then your things that you don't use as often can go on a higher or lower shelf. Does that make sense? It, it absolutely does. Jessica, many of our listeners are, are approaching retirement, and mm -hmm. many are considering downsizing. So what are the best ways to approach downsizing all your stuff? Um, are you wanting – kitchen specific or just in general well no like in general if people are moving into a smaller space or they're going to downsize their home and they got to get rid of a bunch of their stuff that can be daunting yeah for sure um i typically tell people you know there's there's a couple different categories when i go into people's homes there is the stuff that you want to keep obviously the stuff that you want to sell the stuff that you want to donate and the stuff that you want to give to to loved ones 
Um, and that's really the approach I take. You know, you don't want to leave your family members. Eventually, we're all going to leave our family members. And you don't want to leave them with, you know, this daunting task of going through your thing and trying to figure that, that process out on their own. So I think when you're going, when you're, you're entering a stage of retiring and downsizing, I think that is a gr- great opportunity to do that. Yeah, you know, that's a great point because you mentioned you've got the four young kids. Well, my kids, I've got mm-hmm. a sophomore in college and a freshman in high school. Now, we want right. them to feel like when they come home, they're coming home. You know, we want them to feel yeah. like it's a safe, happy place for them to come visit us. But at the same point, yeah. they're not living here. And yeah, so it exactly. seems like we should be addressing a lot of that as we go, right? Yeah. And, you know, um, that is something that I actually work with my clients that actually have young kids with too, because I try to tell them, you know, when you got married, when you got married, did your parents give you a bunch of boxes? They did. Most of us, our parents, you know, we move into our house, we finally have storage space and our parents come over and they just give us box after box after box of our stuff that they saved over the years. Um, And, you know, when you're newly married and you're, you're buying your own stuff, that's not, that that almost becomes a little bit of a burden to people. It is. Um, so I, you know, and so I tell my clients, even from a very young age, kind of the same thing I was talking about with the closet. Pick a pick a bin. Pick a big. It, it can be as big as you want. I mean, they only make them so big. So, and start just putting things in there that you that are special to you that you want your children to have. That way, when they move out and you can give them this one bin or tote or box. It, it gives them the time and the, it's not overwhelming to them. And they'll actually want to sit down and go through it with their children and show them pictures or show them awards. Um, hey, Jessica, that, have, those are great ideas. We're out of time. How yeah. can people learn more okay. about you and contact you <laughs> to learn more about your services? Um, they can go to organizedandsimpleliving.com. You spell out and. Um, and they can fill out a contact form and um, send me an email. Great. And that's organized with a D, right? Organized and simple living. Yes. Dot yep. com. Okay. Jessica Albright, thank you so much for coming on with us today. Thank you for having me. Today we've discussed for spring cleaning and allergies because a greater health and organization and cleanliness provides for more living so you can live the best years of your life your way. Thank you for tuning in to Newstalk 98.7 WOKI.